fair to say that I've been truly raised on rock and, and a healthy diet of The Doors, Sabbath, Zeppelin, The Rolling Stones, Alice Cooper, Deep Purple, and other great bands and artists of the 60s and 70s. But uh, then came the time uh, when I went out to buy my own records. And, and I still remember it, it was in the summer of 93, which I spent in the UK. Uh, and I was for the first time and, and madly in love with this, this uh, cool girl. And uh, she liked the fact that I was into the doors because as a wise man once said, all good girls love the doors. But unfortunately she then quickly lost interest in me as she uh, realized that I knew nothing about the music of the day. And so I took all the pocket money I had saved and went down to this record store. And there was this uh, very Jack Black and High Fidelity kind of guy. And, and he asked me about the music I liked. And after I told him what I had been raised on uh, and how much money I had on me, he disappeared. And when he came back, he gave me 13 records, which I bought and which forever changed my life. And they were Epithet for Destruction, Use the Illusion 1 and 2 by Guns N' Roses, The Black Album by Metallica, Pearl Jam's 10, Nirvana's Nevermind, the first three Danzig albums, Bloody Kisses by Typo Negative, River Runs Red by Life of Agony, and Electric and Sonic Tempo by The Cult. The reason I'm telling you all of this is so you understand why I'm so excited to welcome today's guest on, on Epithet for Disruption to discuss how to create something that translates into long-term success, how to prepare for the times when the going gets tough, and how to bounce back. The cult guitarist, Billy Duffy. Two guys at the bar, <laughs> Two guys at drinking the bar. a water <laughs> in the middle of the day at the Sunset Marquee. What could be anything more <laughs> unnatural than that? <laughs> Rolling? <clears throat> Billy, wonderful to have you with us. Um, thank you so much for, for your time. Um, your, your journey through the uh, changing seas of, mu of the music industry started way back in the 80s and continues until this very day. Um, can you please share with us how it all started, which heights you have reached and which lows you had to endure? Well, that's, a, that's a very broad reaching question. That's, uh, have you got half an hour? Um, how did it start? It started like it started with, for me, with every, every kid in the 70s. You know, there's really only two things that you could really want to aspire to be in the UK, which was either a football player, and I was mediocre at that, and, or a musician. And um, I was mediocre at that. But punk rock happened, and punk made it very... Um, opened up a lot of doors. Everybody had a band. Everybody wanted to be a guitar hero. It's unlike today where people want to be a DJ or people want to be a lot of different... They just actually just want to be rich and famous without any of the work, which is smart. But in those days, the idea was, you know, it was cool to be in a band and I just wanted to be a guitar player, not a singer, because singers made me... I never liked singers. They were always weird. And, uh, but well, that's how it started. It started, any, any other kid will tell you the same thing, probably of my age. And uh, I just got lucky that punk rock happened and that changed the landscape in England musically, but also in terms of accessibility to take what I thought could have been a hobby and turn it into something more serious. And uh, that was kind of it. So I always give sort of respect to the punk rock. That's when I left high school in 1977 in England, in Manchester. And, Punk was a big part of my story. So you essentially started out in clubs and then went all the way to stadium rock. Um, yeah, in, in yeah, I mean that that's how it started. Um, the cult was a few bands after that. I, you know, I mean, I, I ultimately was fortunate enough to find a partner eventually after about six or seven years who um, was we were compatible enough and shared enough of the same goals that we could, we formed a pretty strong bond as a songwriting partnership and as business partners. And that's as, as endured for nearly 40 years. So, so in that respect, I'm very lucky because there's a lot of great musicians who never find 
their other half, if you will. You know, they never right. quite find that. And um, I was always into collaborating. I always thought the best bands had two cool guys. I never really liked solo acts, right. where it was just about one guy and his vision. I liked the combination of, of, of musicians and, and the kind of um, juxtaposition. So, uh, But yeah, I mean, that, that was it really, the, the, the cult. You know, the, there were bands before the cult. I had some success. I, I, you know, I was on British national television with one band, and then within a few months, I was signing on the dole again and living on somebody's floor. I mean, true story. Because, <clears throat> you know, it's very fragile. You know, one minute I was in a band, the next minute I got the boot from the band and I hadn't got anywhere to live and... You know, it was kind of traumatic, actually. It wasn't... I mean, I endured it. And, you you know, you're resilient when you're 20 years old. But um, that was an interesting time for me to sort of... On the one hand, people have been on national television in, in the UK on top of the pops. That's a big deal, or it was in those days. Um, and then to go and be sort of homeless and, uh, like, couch surfing and unemployed was interesting. You know, that, so I'm, what I'm getting at is that that kind of was a bit of a wake up call for me to the fragility of being, you know, in a band. Because I'd given up a pretty good job working in London selling clothes and to join a band. And actually, my commitment to that band was that I was on far less money and I'd spent all my money buying a fancy looking white guitar to be in this band because that was kind of the look. And uh, it basically made me penniless. And I didn't really, you know, I went from being comfortable to being like quite fragile. So it was a bit of a shock. Right. You know. uh, but, you know, I mean, in terms of the cult, yeah, I mean, we started off. The thing I would say about the cult um, was that both myself and Ian had both come from bands that were known. So we didn't come from nowhere, um, which is a plus and a minus. There was people who were fans of the previous bands who didn't necessarily like what we were doing, you know, and so there's, you're always going to get a bit of a um, initial hostility when your band is a hybrid between members of X bands. You, um, but we sort of, I felt, you know, obviously over time we, we overcame that and just kind of ploughed through um, with the singularity of vision. And uh, that was kind of what we, and I think what was important with the cult was we had a very simple goal we just wanted to be a rock band and two guys making music and doing rock music and being free to write and perform the kind of music that we want to do. That was it. There was nothing more complicated than that. You know, um, and at the time, in the 80s, you know, there was a lot of tribalism in the English music scene. I think you'll, you'll probably be aware, being European, that... There was a lot of subcultural little pockets. So if you liked goth, you couldn't like rock, or if you liked metal, you couldn't like punk, or if you liked reggae, you couldn't like this. And there's a lot of negative, like I define myself by what I don't like. And one of the goals of the cult, and which is why we changed our name, because originally we were called the Death Cult, we felt that that was somewhat pigeonholy in a gothic sense. And it was the period when everybody was doing the whole gothic, frightening bats in the belfry, Bella Lugosi's dead period. And it seemed kind of funny to us. So we changed the name in uh, January 1984, which again was a calculated decision. We also changed it on national television. We got a TV show called The Tube uh, with a guy called uh, Jules Holland. And we decided in our little scheme that that would be a great opportunity and he introduced the band and said they used to be called the sudden death cult which was slightly inaccurate but we went with it then the death cult and now they're called the cult and we did that in uh, just to to give ourselves the freedom right but you did bring all of those elements together i mean there is the gothic element in the cult there is the rock element in there uh, there's a little bit yeah, of the doors yeah. it's it's all in there i mean it's all in the dna but you've got to allow yourself to flourish and you have to be strong enough to give yourself you have to have two things you have to have some success then people believe in you and then that will give you the freedom to kind of relax and not try and worry about peer pressure and because there's a lot of that and back in the day and when, when obviously media was very newspaper centric 
it was important what was said about you in the music press. Um, and it, there was always this massive fear of my generation of musicians to be not liked by the press. Certain artists even wrote songs about it. It was so bad. If you weren't liked, and we weren't particularly liked until after quite a while, it was a rough ride. If your band wasn't what you would call a press darling, because that was how people got their information about new bands. The, the, some journalists would write a glowing review and people were like, wow, I've got to check this band out. And that's how it worked for me. That's how I saw the Sex Pistols. Was I saw somebody had written an article on the Sex Pistols and I wanted to find out what that was. And they came to Manchester in 1976 and I was lucky enough to see a show um, with the Buzzcocks and Slaughter and the Dogs. And that was a big deal for me uh, amongst going to 50 other shows, varying from Leonard Skinner to Queen to... Eddie and the Hot Rods to be anything. I'd go and see anything. Uriah Heep, it didn't matter. But then I started going to a lot of punk gigs as well. And um, there's always been that duality with the cult, both of me and Ian, where we both punk guys and it's in the DNA. But there's always been a, a through line of rock. You know, I like classic British rock, like Free and Bad Company. I've always liked that kind of music. Um, so there's been a bit of a duality, you know, um, and Ian's the same. He, he, the only difference with Ian was that he spent his teenage years in Canada. Um, so he got exposed to American FM radio uh, in the 70s, which is something I never heard of. So all those bands like Kansas and Toto and Journey and all that music that meant nothing to me. He was exposed to it because that was on the radio in Canada and around him growing up. Um, I don't particularly think he liked it, but he was much more aware of that having spent time in North America, so. Well, it's that. interesting to hear yeah. that <clears throat> there was an element of a conscious decision and also thinking about how you structure this, how you go forward, which I think is even more important and probably part of your success and the endurance of your success because the music business itself has changed dramatically and if there wasn't this element of reflection and thinking about it, you probably wouldn't have yeah. lasted so long. We, we definitely made some decisions. I mean, another decision that we made, we weren't super calculated. I mean, it wasn't like we were scheming, but we, we had, we planned things as best we could. We, we signed to an independent label, which was the label that Ian's band were already signed to. We didn't entertain going out and trying to sign to a bigger corporate label or whatever. We were happy to get a deal through Beggar's Banquet, who mm -hmm. released all those British, and, and luckily they're still going. Right. Um, and so that was another decision where we wanted to have the freedom to do what we wanted musically. And you don't get that if you sign to a big corporate label. They start putting pressure on you. I'll tell you how it's done, yeah. Kind of, yeah. So, you know, there's pluses and minuses, you know. Um, but I, I felt comfortable making that decision, you know. Right. It was music first. I mean, we wanted to make music. You know, the money side of it and wanted to support ourselves. You know, I'll tell you a funny story. The, the first time we sat down with Martin Mills, who is still the owner of the Beggars Group, so this is 1983, um, we, we, we just want... We, our, deal, we, our deal, first record was put out on a handshake. There was no contract. It was done on a gentleman's agreement, we, we, which was funny when you think about it. And we, we wanted to go on some kind of salary because I needed money to, like, pay bills on a weekly basis. So... I remember a conversation between me, Ian and Martin Mills regarding what was the dole paying in England at that time, which I believe was about £69 a week. So that was the baseline in which I, we were willing to move forwards with Beggar's Banquet, as long as we could generate initially that. Um, we were just kind of pragmatic in terms of like building the thing slowly and carefully. And I'm reacting to whatever. You can't buy success, or you can, well, you can try, but um, whatever success we got, you know, we kind of planned with that. Right. But you also were quite responsive to the environment changing because the music industry has gone through massive change. Uh, a friend just summarized it recently by saying, in the old days, he used to tour to sell records. Now he's doing records so he can tour and sell t shirts. Yeah, and you, of course. And you, yeah. and you did. Um, some, some quite interesting things early. I remember 
uh, those recordings you put out on, on sort of electronic media very early yeah. and your own selling. Like I yeah. remember the, the last record I bought uh, on, on vinyl directly. Yeah, on, yeah, on yeah. Store. Yeah, absolutely. We, you know, Ian's always been very progressive about, about how he perceives the band being marketed. And, you know, he tries, to, he's, he's always been very on the front foot. I'm not quite so much myself, but that's the essence of a partnership. You know, there's things I'm very good at, there's things that he's very good at. And um, in, 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 an essence, in essence, that's fortunate um, uh, in a partnership. But yeah, we, we, we've always released vinyl. Ian's been very passionate about that kind of stuff. We've always put records out on vinyl when we can. Beyond Good and Evil isn't out on vinyl, which is... Uh, Beyond Good and Evil is not out at all. And that's a telling story because that's the only record we've ever done on a big label. That's on Atlantic and it's not even available. So that was our one, one, one out of 10, I think 10 albums we've done, yeah. 11 maybe, I don't know, 10 or 11. That's the one that was done with a big corporate entity. It's not available and they wouldn't do stuff. Which is a shame, it's an amazing record. It's a solid record. There's nothing wrong with the quality of the record, but unfortunately, um, that's kind of a, a, a proof positive that, you know, that's how it can go if you go down that road. Yeah. I know there, there's a lot of fans out there trying to, to find it, you know, on vinyl, and there's a couple of bootlegs and stuff going around, but, you know, for the true believers, they want the real one, so... Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a difficult situation. I haven't really got into... I'd like to get, try and get that record back, but it's very difficult. I think we owed them an awful lot of money. I think that was the problem. Our, our side of it was, I think, we spent a fortune making that record, and they, never, they were never in 10 lifetimes going to make the money back. <laughs> Well, we could crowdfund and, um, and get it uh, to the fans. Yeah, make them an offer, whoever they are, whoever Atlantic Records are now. It was on Lava, which was a guy called Jason Flom's imprint label through Atlantic. And another funny story, actually, about that is decisions. You're talking about business decisions. We actually turned down a deal with Clive Davis, which in retrospect, I think, was a mistake. I like Jason Flom. I had no problem with him. We thought Atlantic would be a better home for the cult. Rock, Zeppelin... Atlantic, I'm Ergen, the whole history of Atlantic Records. We, we, in retrospect, we probably should have gone with Clive Davis. He actually offered us more money. And for once, we, we made an altruistic decision that I think probably backfired. We might have been better off with, um, with going with Clive Davis. Right. And in fact, I'm sure we would have. Well, there's hope that this record will see the light of day again in a reissue form or something. Yeah, maybe. Well, let's, let's hope for that. Okay. Thinking about the, the music industry today, right. I mean, there is a lot of uh, musicians still out there. Sure. Do you think they have a chance today? You know, I think the, the buying pattern has totally changed. And yes, there is social media where you can reach out to a fan base, but do you think bands today have a chance to build up a solid fan base? Um, mm, 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 mm. I think there's like a lot of quantity out there. I think some of the quality gets buried. Um, I also think that there's a bit of um, a leveling in that if everybody can release, if everybody can get their music out there, it just creates a lot of static in in the um, in the mark in the marketplace. It's very difficult. Also, as people, it's kind of linked. People used to listen to DJs and radio stations before they became totally corporate and, and diminished in value. They used, to, um, they used to educate you as to new music. Now they play the same records over and over and over again. So how do you find good new music? What's your peer-to-peer? -peer? Either it's going to be a friend turns you on to it or you're going to maybe listen to kind of a curated radio show. Right. Um, because it's difficult to find out what's good. So in, the, in, in a lot of respects, people just turn off. If you, I don't know, young people will find out. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm an older guy. I, don't, I can't really speak for young people. I'm sure their resilience and enthusiasm will see them through uh, at the end of the day. So, I, I mean, I, you know, that's really not my problem. That's their problem. And they'll find a solution to it. You know, we had our own problems to deal with. And right. the last thing they need is advice from old people because <laughs> they're not well, going to take it anyway. Well, there is wisdom in that sometimes, so... In Asian cultures, usually in Western cultures, old people are not really taken very seriously. Where you know, but the wisdom's kind of eventually maybe. But so we touched a little bit on on what uh, triggered the success of the cult, but I believe there's more to it. I mean, I've been listening 
to it for, for decades now. Yeah. So there, there's more to it. So what do you think were really the, the components that not only led to the success, but also allowed it to stay relevant and most importantly in the hearts of the fans? Well, I mean, I think that's, 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 that's more of a question of, I guess, integrity and honesty of the, the, the art side of it, if you will. And that would be, you know, Ian's a very passionate guy. He's very um, committed in that moment to what he's doing. And he's a, a changeable individual. He's not the same guy he was 35 years ago. Um, and I think that's, you know, a plus and a minus. But I think in general terms, um, most bands who endure uh, a, a put some sort of integrity into what they do. Right. And I think that's really the reason why the cult, and probably a reason why the cult never has got as big as it could have done. Because the bands never really had the vast quantity of record sales that bands who you might consider to be more, um, less pioneering. Right. We took some chances, some of it was dumb luck, we got lucky, we, you know, we, we, you know, we had some successes, we had some failures, um, but it was all done with the best of intentions, right. music first. Um, you, you know, if you stick around long enough, you can begin to see that there is a degree of cynicism and people doing music to make money, not, you know, making music and enjoying the benefits of good art. It's just really a question of, I have no complaints, but it's just an observation. One of the things I've noticed that mediocre bands can sell a lot of records. The best quote ever, I'll give you a quote, not mine, Ian Asprey. Don't ever confuse bigness with greatness, which I think is probably his best quote I've ever heard, in four, and I've heard many, in 40 years. He said that to somebody in a very, very big band who'd sold a lot of records and were doing arenas and football stadiums. Doesn't matter. David Bowie's first platinum album was Let's Dance in America. I mean, he'd made some rather good music prior to that. Yes. Uh, had been ignored until he turned really kind of cheesy pop and he made a decision to, you know, wear a nice suit and comb his hair and make dance music. But, you know, it, it, there's no indication. The Who are the same. There's another band, fantastic band, pioneering, breakthrough. Never really sold a ton of records. There's a lot worse bands sold a lot more records. You know, it depends where, where you're coming from and does that even really matter? I mean, as long as I got somewhere to sleep and... You know what I mean? It depends what your goal is, and that, that's, that's another question of, um, you know, that be then becomes down to the, the individual integrity of the members of the band, and if you can keep your band together, and if you can stand the sight of each other after 30 years. You know what I mean? That's a whole other conversation, yeah. That, that's an achievement in itself. Well, I think you, you just never sold out. I mean, this is just my view as a fan, you know. Every right. record, there was like a journey of discovery. There was the artwork, there was the messages you had in there, the layered music. There was always something to discover. It was never yeah. sort of trying to fit into the day. Obviously, you adapted to some yeah, degree, but you yeah, never I mean, sold you, out. Our music was just, to me, I always felt we just trying to reflect our environment. And the environment in the late 80s was, it changed from a kind of a gothic post-punk kind of thing to a hard rock thing, which was, you know, probably typified by the size of Guns N' Roses, which, you know, eventually became super massive, right? And, you know, they supported us in the 87, which was great. We invited them on tour. But my point was the whole world went rock on a global scale. Everybody, the average guy in the street was into rock for a hot minute. And, um, you know, you just reflect your environment and then different musical forms take precedence and... You know, it's natural, it's a natural cycle of things, you know, um, and the good stuff sticks around. At the end of the day, you know, the biggest, the, the obvious quote that you'll hear from everybody is, you know, it's all about a song, really. If you don't have good songs, you don't really have anything. Well, thank God you had more than one. You had Just plenty. a couple, yeah. More than one's handy. Definitely being a one-hit wonder is, is probably a hard place to be. Right. So let's maybe uh, talk for a little bit about yourself. I mean, okay. you've been performing for 40 years on right. the highest level. Now, how do you get to do that? I mean, is this uh, talent? Is it hard work? Is it luck? Is it all together? Um, I, th I think it's a bit, a bit of all of it. I don't, I don't necessarily think... Um, I think making the right decisions, seizing the right opportunity in the moment, when you reflect back, there's probably points in everybody's life where there's like some sort of crossroads and, you know, you take which fork in the road you take 
And at the time, you just follow your gut. And if your gut, gut's good, then um, maybe you get lucky. You know, you make more. I think, in essence, if you make more right decisions than wrong decisions, you'll end up winning. Right. You know, um, other than that, you know, it's really just, you know, you've been able to sleep at night. I just think, I mean, the cult, you know, there's times when we bowed to pressure. And there's certainly I'm guilty of you know, not being as flexible, you know, my side of the cult would be adding the more conservative one, you know, so if we've made an album that's been our most successful album, my logical, the way my brain works is, well, we want to make another record like that. Now, that isn't the way my partner's brain always works. So having to, and that can cause conflict on both sides of it, you know, um, that's a real situation. It happens in a lot of bands. Um, and the other thing that's probably worth pointing out with the call, I don't know whether, in a lot of bands, you know, you'll get songs that are like written by the singer or written by the guitar player with a teeny little bit, bit of help from other, with me and him, it's always been a 50-50 collaboration and we've also split everything 50-50 since day one. So we've never had any hassles over money or that type of thing. You know, our, our conflicts are mainly, if ever, a creative which is the best kind of conflict to have. And I think with age, you learn a bit more of compassion and humility and understanding. So you don't go into like a situation where you just can't tolerate each other, or at least that's what I hope. And I think most bands that last that long um, do. But it's different, you know, a lot of people, you know, probably don't get it. They just assume that maybe I, Ian writes all the songs you know, or whatever. I don't know, I don't, or, in, you know. Usually oh, they I, think, well, I don't think so with you, because I remember uh, as a kid, I, I had this poster of the two of you, you know, All it was right. him with the black hair and oh, he with yeah. the blonde hair. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it was like, almost like uh, Keys and Mick, you know, of my age. I feel like it was this combination, the twins almost. Well, we, uh, yeah, we, 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 you know, we've just been sort of 50-50 partners in it and we've, you know, whatever our trials and tribulations, we've always uh, managed to uh, muggle through. You know I think I mean? it has come come through as such. And maybe on, on that note, mm -hmm. again, remembering this image, which sort of got etched in, right. into my brain, how important do you think it is to, to create an image and to have some recognition value? You know, like when, when you oh, see an yeah. Apple computer, you know, it's an Apple computer, or when you see a certain Swiss watch, that's what you know. And the same with you, you know, the, the moment somebody says, Billy Duffy, I immediately have this image of you with the White Falcon. Right, right, the right, iconic, right. Um, The iconic pose, you know? <laughs> Um, yeah, well, that's funny because that's two images. The iconic poses of me with a Les Paul. The Falcon's yes. a different thing. I would, I, I agree. I mean, everything you've said there, I agree. It's very important. I mean, if you look at, I mean, I'm, I'm looking over, over there. I see a picture of Slash. It's a top hat, isn't it? It's yeah. the top hat and the hair. You know, it's, it's. You look at, you know, Ozzy. It's the certain things, and you know, Billy Idol, and the, the hair, and the, you know. Um, but was that conscious or was it luck? No, no. Well, I think we've changed a lot. The thing about the court is, like, we, actually, to our detriment, we haven't really had what you would call a logo. Like, for, like for example, you, you'd say Motorhead. Well, you think of that one logo or the Ramones. You think of that one iconic logo. The cult, we never really settled on one. And I think possibly that's been a bit of our detriment. But, you know, I can't really... That's our story. That's me looking back, thinking about it. At the time, you just move forwards. Oh, that looks good. Let's go down that road artistically. Right. Looking back, there are bands where, you know, it's almost like a rubber stamp. But there was a decision, for example, with Sonic Temple. I mean, two things. The white guitar, the Gretsch, was initially gotten to be in a band before the call, and it became kind of iconic. It's a bit of a, like a Cadillac guitar. It makes a big statement. You know, it, it, it's a big presence. But it also has a sound and it challenges you in the way that you can play it because you can't play it like a Les Paul. It's not made. It's, a, it's, it's, like, um, it's like a big car. You, can't drive, you wouldn't drive it around a racetrack. You know what I mean? It's not a sports car. So it made me write in a different way and that was part of the cult sound initially, the, 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 the way that forced me to perform. Um, and that was what I was looking for after punk. So there's always, it's not just about the look of the guitar. You've got to understand the Gretsch sounded different. We were all, after the Pistols and the Clash and the Damned and the Banshees, we were all looking in the early 80s for our own signature sound. And you've got like The Edge and John McGeeck and the Psychedelic Furs guys and um, Will from uh, Echo and the Bunnymen and a billion great guitar players. We were all reaching for something. 
and trying to find our own identity because you're not going to out Steve Jones, Steve Jones. That was it. Done. Period. That's it. So that was the, there's, there's the look, but it's not about the look as much as it's about the sound. Mm. The balance between that. And so image is important if you've got something to back it up, but you, you can't just be all image. No, Eventually think, you'll get found out. You have to have substance right. with it. Um, and then the, the, the Sonic Temple thing was definitely, um, we realised that that period in time was a very strong rock period for, for the world culture, like we talked about. Rock was big and back. Punk was over, rock was back. And we just were looked for an image and we, we actually, we talked about um, the pictures of The Who with Pete Townsend holding up the guitar in the air and images of him jumping up with the Les Paul. And the guitar he held in the air, funnily enough, was an SG, but it was that iconic imagery, it just said rock. And we just felt, Ian decided and we both agreed with the guy at Design the Sleeve that the guitar is the most iconic element of rock music. You know, we, we played around with some images um, of the lead singer with a microphone and the spotlight and like the, the Free Story sleeve or Queen's first album. And that focused on the lead singer and the iconic mic and the spotlight and that kind of thing. But we just felt with the cult, as it was quite guitar orientated music um, and kind of still is, that the guitar, it wasn't about me, it was about the, 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 the rubber stamp. And that's how we came up with that particular on, image. On, on this one, will, will you share a secret with us? Because w I've been a, a huge collector of rock photography for many years. Okay. And, and you know, I got all the great <coughs> photos from Jim Marshall and, and others. Right. And, and I tried to desperately find that image and, and buy a copy of it to put on, on my wall. Right. The, the image by Andrew McPherson. Right. And I came to realize it doesn't exist. I mean, I, I wouldn't know where it is. I've, I've got some eight by tens of it, but Andrew McPherson took it and I would imagine... Is it a real image or has it been composed? No, it was a real photo. Right. It was based on, I mean, the embarrassing side of the story is I'm, I'm old enough and I don't care enough to admit. It was, based on a, it was based on a shot of me live that I was doing the arm in the air thing, but it didn't look right. So we had to recreate it, right. much to my embarrassment in Hollywood in a studio which involved him laying on the floor and me standing on some sound stage in the rock regalia pulling off the image and another little thing that you won't notice if you actually look at the sleeve it says the cult my arm in reality in the real photo didn't neatly fit between the two things um, because I'd not discovered yoga at that point but so we moved the arm to fit between the cult. Right. I mean, one of the things about the cult is once, once we're done with something, we just kind of move forward. I think it's important not to dwell too much and create your, curate your own history. It's, it's okay. I'm not going to disabuse anybody of anything that they might or might not believe about the cult's history. But on the same token, I'm more focused in the next step forward because nobody else can do it. So me and Ian have to always be somewhat progressive, you know. I mean, I'm all for people liking rock music and it's what I grew up with and I, I still love rock music to this day. But I don't, the nostalgia side of it personally makes me feel a little uncomfortable. I'll be totally honest. Right. There's nothing I like less than seeing fat old men playing songs badly to pay bills on stage. I just, it makes me sick because it basically destroys what I, I don't want to see that. And, you know, I, I, so, I mean, it's just the way I am. It's a prejudice, personally, I have. I'm not saying that all rock, but some bands still do it well. And you believe and you go and see them in their age and they keep in shape and they take care of themselves and they put on a good energetic show. And you can see that they're not paying the bills. And that's where I choose to go. And, you know, that's where my entertainment dollar will go or pound or shekel. Maybe to, to take this in a slightly <clears throat> different direction. Uh, I believe that, that anyone starting out on an entrepreneurial career and that's you know, the same if you start out as a musician right. as well as a say, tech innovator, uh, there's always this entrepreneurial element in it. Right. And, and if you don't recognize that, then you probably won't make it or at mm. least not for the long, long run. And what I see many is focusing purely on the art or purely on the technology or whatever it is right. and missing out on, on the basics. So. Um, 
how important do you think it is to understand the basics of your business so you don't get taken for a ride and you can actually prolong it into the future? Uh, well, well, it is important, and I, I would say my opinion on that, I, I agree with that. It's important to understand what's happening. I think too much information, I mean, I make mistakes, and I supposedly know what's up with f the money and bands and stuff. I made mistakes early on in the in my in the career i think every generation if you go back to the inception of say modern rock which is like i guess when american folk music met black r b and you ended up with rock and roll in the 50s well you know like from you know giving somebody a cadillac and taking all these royalties to today we've come a long way but still my record my recordings are owned in perpetuity by Beggar's Banquet Records. Perpetuity, which as Steven Tyler said, is an interesting word. So that's how the business is. They loan you money to make a record. You pay that loan back infinitesimally a million times back and they still, you don't get back the actual product or thing that you were given the loan for. There's no cutoff point. They never give it back to you. Some bands get lucky and they get their catalogue back, but other bands, you know, it's a double-edged sword. We never got ours back. So, you know, I don't, I'm not complaining about it, but that is how it is. That's the reality. You know, I will never own She Sells Sanctuary's record, master recording. Me and Ian will never own it. Neither will any of our kith and kin. It's going to always be owned by Beggar's Banquet, unless they wake up one day and give it back to us. But they won't and nor should they but that's how the music business works and those are the things that have, are changing um and that those are that you deal with the cards you dealt at the time um but i just you know you you, you try and get good advice you know that they, uh, they, i'm sure as you know because you mentioned to me briefly your dad was in that kind of situation the 70s was somewhat horrific i think that's why um your dad was a busy guy when I think because the taxation in England was about 85%, wasn't it? 90%. I think I believe the Beatles wrote a song on the subject yeah. called Tax Man. I think that covered up what was going on there. So um, what I'm saying, well, basically in essence, each generation learns a bit more and you get a bit more savvy. And also information now is out there, probably too much of it. So it's a question of disseminating it. Before, the information wasn't readily available. You had to be lucky to get an accountant or a business manager or a manager who wasn't a thief, you know, who had integrity. Um, and they weren't always this, that case. Now it's a little more transparent. So what you're looking for is good advice um, and just trying to get through the static and make choices but ultimately really it's a it's still a, it's still about art hmm. it's about creating something artistically valid and then being okay to maximize that financially you know it's a good idea or a good song um and doing the legwork you know you have to put the sort of perspiration into it which is bands going on tour you know i mean that's you know, that's one of the differences. You're not just sitting around your house. You have to make a record and go out and promote it, you know? Absolutely. I think the, the environment you, you live in and, and you're exposed to also has an impact. Has moving from the UK to, to LA had an impact on you? Um, yeah, it's probably softened me up a bit, to be honest. I, I you know, I... Started the yoga. <laughs> yeah, I just got... I, I chose the, to, to come here, actually. I mean, it wasn't like... A, a lot of people come here to make it. You know, that's the cliche, it, usually in the music, uh, the, the movie business or whatever, and they end up being a waiter or whatever. Um, I just like the lifestyle. You know, I'd achieved a moderate amount of success in the UK and I just made a choice um, in January of 1988 that I'd rather spend my off time in the sunshine enjoying a more Mediterranean, relaxed and friendly environment than being in London getting snowed on and having my car clamped. And I just was, I found that the, um, my, the appeal for Los Angeles and California in general for me at the time was a lot more freedom. It's got a little more like Europe now, but I, I just am the more of a kind of person that prefers to be left alone. I don't like being told by the state what to do and I just lean towards that. So leave me alone, I'll be fine. 
And um, California represented that to me. It wasn't like I needed to come in and make it because I had the call. We'd already had a gold album, gold album, whatever success I could even have envisaged I'd had. So it was a different story for me to come here. You know, I, I, I enjoyed the lifestyle um, and the weather and the whole thing of the West Coast of America uh, rather than um, where I was living in London, which I wasn't enjoying. It was getting a little toxic for me. So now you get to drive this wonderful British bike, which I saw before in the Well, sun. it doesn't, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it, well, it doesn't rain. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I could live in the UK and, and as, as I'm older now, I, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to be in London, but um, it, it, circumstances. Um, I, I actually went back and lived in England in the late 90s for about five years, and it was fine. Um, I'd come back here and visit, but the cold circumstances, one of those moments where I had a choice, and it was like, do you give up what you've sort of established in the UK and come back and do the cult again? which was 18 years ago, or do you stay? And I, you know, those are those, those kind of pivotal moments where you just have to have a clear mind and make a decision. And, um, and, it, and you know, it's worked out. I didn't know the cult would last longer than six months. But, um, you know, it's been on and off eight, you know, out of those 18 years, you know, we've been working 16 of them. Impressive. Maybe to, to conclude, um you know, you've gone through different phases, and I think one thing you've proven is that you can bounce back, uh, because mm -hmm. whatever you do, there was huge changes in the yeah, crunch yeah, yeah. movement, electronic music coming up, and so sure. forth, uh, and you've managed that, and I think it is a key skill for long-term sustained success. Yeah. And, and many people today, I think if they have one little element of pushback, they immediately give up and, and uh, fold their cards. Yeah. Uh, I think, have you have you developed that over time? Is this part of your DNA, uh, or or? I think it's that? a bit of both. I think I think part of it's like, you know, kind of like some people like to an extent I think we thrive on the conflict and and we we see ourselves as the cult as a bit of an underdog. If I was being truthful, I think we we see ourselves as that. And if you get that underdog mentality, you always want to get back and keep fighting. You know, um, you know, we've never had it super easy. The time when the cult is actually in trouble is when everything's going really well. Um, we seem to seem to operate quite well in adversity. I don't know how much better we could operate, but as far as I've observed, you know. So, yeah, I think I think it's a British thing, isn't it? It's a tough uh, upper lip kind uh, of thing. Maybe, maybe it's a, yeah, it's a stubbornness, um, you know, and and a bit of a belief, or or being too dumb to quit. Yeah, who knows? One final question okay. I can't do without that. What's next for the cult? Um, well, with the cult, you always get, it'll always be new music because Ian loves making new music. What that'll be, how much of it, depends on how good it is. We're at that phase where we'll definitely get together and write some new music, whether it's one song, 10 songs. Well, really, to me, it's just about the quality and you have to have some quantity to whittle down the quality. That's something that's kind of the cost of entry for Ian Asprey. He likes to do that. Um, for me, I, I like to do, I'm a guitar player, I, I look at it like I'm a kind of a tradesman. I like to go to work with my guitar, play a gig, have some fun, um, earn an honest living, you know. Um, and so those two elements, we'll be doing both of those two things and that's about, about it, I would imagine. Thank you so much, that was wonderful. All right. Keep, really, keep it coming. You're welcome. Thank you. Cheers. Got everything? Super. Cool. That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs>